Hello, my name is the Reverend Ken Hawes. I am the pastor at Fairhaven United Methodist Church in Darnstown, and it is my privilege this afternoon uh, to spend some time thinking with you about inclusion and holiness and the law. The questions we are considering today are how do we determine what is holy? How can we legislate what is holy and acceptable conduct or behavior? How do we discern what is right and wrong? So in order to do that, I'd like to lift up first um, some, some of the scriptures from Acts 15, and then we're going to take a look at some of the holiness code in Leviticus, and we'll try to think together about how we discern some of these issues. So the Christian message was spreading quickly from Jerusalem, and the church was growing. Reverend Bonnie shared some of the distinctions between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and as Christianity spread into the non-Jewish and Gentile world, these differences came to a head. In many ways, the question became, what does it mean to be a Christian? Does one have to become Jewish first? Does everybody have to be circumcised? Does everyone have to follow all 613 of the laws that are outlined in Torah? Acts 15 tells the story of convening a conference of leaders to consider some of these questions. Some have quipped that that was the first general conference. I don't want to digress, so we'll go on. But um, there were some unnamed teachers that told the Gentiles that they must be circumcised or they weren't actually saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, and the group of people get into a debate, and they determine that they actually can't come to a conclusion. So since the center of the early church was in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas go to the leaders in Jerusalem to ask the question. The Re Jerusalem council hadn't thought about it either, and they actually are divided about it. One of the Pharisees stood up, and they said, they must be circumcised, the Gentiles must be circumcised, and they must keep the law of Moses. And the scripture says that the apostles and the elders considered the matter, and after there was much debate, Peter stood up. Peter begins to assert his leadership, and he points out the working of the Holy Spirit that he has witnessed. And he concludes by saying, the Spirit has made no distinction. So essentially, why should we place an undue burden on these new converts? We believe we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Paul and Barnabas then get up to tell everyone of the signs and wonders that the Spirit was doing through their ministry. And after hearing all of this, James speaks up. And James is the brother of Jesus. He was viewed as one of the leaders, or perhaps the leader, in the Jerusalem church at the time. He relates everything he's heard to the prophet Amos. Ultimately, he says it is clear that the Spirit is doing something new in their midst, and expanding the notion of inclusion in God's kingdom. So James decides there is no need to be circumcised for the Gentiles, but they must keep the law of Moses. The council then agrees unanimously, and they send a letter uh, with instructions back with Paul and Barnabas and they pick a couple of additional teachers to help relay the message. So how do we decide what is holy? How do we decide who's in and who's out? Is it even our decision to make? This passage from Acts might give us some ideas. Um, first, uh, we note that people discussed and debated the issues at hand. Then they looked for the work of the Holy Spirit, and they tried to connect it with the scriptures. Maybe that's a clue. But ultimately, no matter what a council or a conference decides, how do you change the hearts and minds of the people? How do they understand what is holy? Matt Skinner, who wrote an excellent study on Acts, writes, People will follow apostles, theologians, and Bible scholars only so far. It's the things that are life-giving that finally settle the debates. 
It's the transforming power of God's salvation that convincingly shows us where God's spirit may be stirring. They must have believed that God was doing something new. I agree with Dr. Skinner. Um, God is always doing something new. God is always working to bring transformation and recreation. So even in the church, God is working to bring recreation and transformation. Over its history, the United Methodist Church and the church itself, but the United Methodist Church in particular, has broadened its understanding of what is good and what is holy, who's in and who's out. I mean, a couple of quick examples. In the Methodist Church, um, women first gained seats at General Conference in 1922. That was quite a few years after the formation of the church. And although, although they were vital to the Methodist movement from the very beginning, women didn't gain full clergy rights until 1956. And then thanks to Evangelical United Brethren insistence, the Central Conferences for African American Methodist Churches were abolished in the 1968 merger. Surely gender and racial struggles continue in the United Methodist Church despite these changes. But women and African Americans have gained further inclusion in the life of the church by those changes. Now since 1973, we have been debating the role and welcome of LGBTQ persons in the life of the United Methodist Church. We're going to discuss a little bit more of that history in a couple of weeks, but to help us think about why that struggle has been so difficult, let's turn to some of the holiness codes in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 18 um, are all the laws regarding sexual relations. And here's an abbreviated version of them. Starting at verse 6. No one is allowed to approach any blood relative for sexual contact. Mother, sister, stepsister, aunt, daughter-in-law, a woman and her daughter, a woman during her menstrual uncleanness, the wife of your fellow Israelite. You must not have sexual intercourse with a man as you would with a woman. It is a detestable practice. You will not have sexual relations with any animal becoming unclean by it, nor will a woman present herself before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. So, at least according to Leviticus, homosexual acts are prohibited in the scriptures. And some will say that God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Others of us um, are, have a little bit more nuanced view. Um, ancient folks would often condemn what they did not understand. So when Leviticus was written, you've heard it already said that there was no understanding of what a loving and committed same-gender relationship would look like. There's no frame of reference. So a primary purpose for marriage at the time was that, was that uh, marriage and sex was for procreation. And that, of course, is not physically possible in same-gender relationships. Obviously, gay men did exist at the time, but people didn't understand the attraction. There wouldn't be a law condemning a practice if the practice was unknown. So we continue to use, or some continue to use, this passage today to discriminate against LGBTQ uh, persons. As we have heard earlier, um, Leviticus dietary laws restricted eating shrimp, camels, and pigs. And it was also forbidden in the law to wear garments of two different fabrics. And if a house got mildewed, you were supposed to burn it down. And if a disobedient child um, annoyed its parents, it could be put to death. So how was it determined that some of these laws no longer apply, while others remain in effect? By its example, my home church taught me how to welcome everyone. Like Reverend Andy, I grew up in the New York Conference. Um, I grew up in a small church in Exurban, New York, where my dad was the musical director. So we were at church a lot. Um, late in the 1970s, a new couple began attending the church, Jerry and Jeffrey, and they were gay. As far as I know, there was never a question about welcoming them into the church. 
I'll be honest, I know there were a few snide comments around our dinner table, which meant there were probably a few snide comments around other dinner tables as well. But Jerry and Jeffrey became full members of the church and became immersed in the ministries of everything that we did. They shared their talents for the sake of Christ, and they were highly respected and welcomed in the congregation. And that's what I began to learn through the love of that small church in Carmel, New York. So who determines what is good and holy? Can we legislate it? We've heard today we discuss it and debate it. We connect it with the scriptures. We watch for the work of the Holy Spirit. And using all those tools, we might discern together that God is doing a new thing. Matt Skinner writes about discernment. When I speak of discernment, I mean a process that involves reflection on who God is, what God desires, and how we God's people, might play a part in being faithful to God's purposes. Discernment entails more than just collecting data, making projections, and choosing a sensible course of action. Discernment is an act of faith, because in the end, the discerners don't say, this is what we choose, but this is where we think we will discover the challenges and rewards of faithfully bearing witness to Jesus. So how do we discern the new things God might be doing in our midst today as we faithfully bear witness to Jesus?